Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Steves, and it is my privilege to be the director of the DePaul Humanity Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to a special evening, as tonight we close out our 2016-17 season, as well as our transformation series by celebrating the golden anniversary of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper. We begin first, though, as we always begin at the Humanity Center, by acknowledging the traditional territory upon which we gather this evening. Long before Europeans arrived, varied and numerous native people sought to walk gently on this land. They offered assistance to the first European travelers to this territory, sharing their knowledge for survival and living a good life. Among others, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Miami, and Illinois inhabited what is now this part of Chicago. While we here today have no power to honor the treaties that were signed, we do recognize that these treaties were brokered under some duress and deception. So it's our hope tonight to honor the good faith with which the native people of the region entered into these treaties. As Potawatomi Chief Matea is purported to have said at the signing of the 1821 Treaty of Chicago, this is a small piece of land, and if we give it away, what will become of us? The great spirit who has provided it to us for our use allows us to keep it. We should incur his anger if we bartered it away. If we had more land, you should have more land. But our land has been wasting away ever since the white people became our neighbors, and we now have hardly enough to cover the bones of our tribe. In solidarity with Chief Matea, we recognize the history and legacy of this subjugation, as well as the enduring presence today of Native Americans among our faculty, staff, student body, and community. And it's thus that we seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on honor and true respect. And now. It was 70 years ago today, Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. It was 50 years ago today, exactly today, June 1st, 1967, that the Beatles released the album Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. For the last 10 months, we've been running a contest to have local artists perform cover versions of tracks from the album. And I'm very pleased to say that tonight you'll hear six live performances, actually seven, as one of our professors tonight will also be performing after his talk. And I want to congratulate the six bands and artists who won the contest and will be performing here tonight. However, I also wanted to take this opportunity to say that although we're very proud of them and proud to offer their work to you tonight, the idea of a contest is not really in keeping with the ethos that we wish to model at the DePaul Humanity Center. Ours is one that eschews capitalism and competition in favor of community and collaboration. And so I also want to take this opportunity to celebrate several other artists who made submissions, great submissions, but for whom we unfortunately don't have the resources of time to feature tonight. So if you're here, please stand up when I call out your band's name or your name. Rebecca Schirschein, Jared Narder Slezak, Kat Rolfs with her bandmates, The Somethings, Ricky Liontones, Danny Donuts. Please, just a round of applause for these people as well. So, I'm going to be back in a few minutes with a proper introduction to the evening, but first it seemed only appropriate to start things off tonight with music. We'll have some fantastic performances for you tonight indeed, so to get us started, here with me for the benefit of Mr. Kite, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Bobby Midnight and the Big Ordeals. Bye. 
that might be helpful to our general investigation. Though I'm certainly happy to have it challenged by our guests, both our lecturers and performers, as we move forward, of course. I thought it might be useful then to consider Sergeant Pepper, not only as a work of art, but one of the first, if not the first, postmodern works of art in rock or popular music. So I tend to believe that concepts are only as real as they are useful. That is, if a concept is helping us somehow to live a better life or to understand something better, then it should be embraced. But otherwise, why bother? The term postmodern means a lot of things to a lot of people. For our current purposes, let me just identify two core elements of postmodern theory. First, postmodernity indicates an attitude of cynicism toward the idea of meta narratives and meta history. That is, the postmodern era is one in which we recognize our necessary historical enmeshment, but reject the notion that there's progress, that there's a direction history or narrative must take, that there's a story on top of all the other stories that's the real story, tying everything else together. This means an embrace of fractures and splinters, splinters even in terms of identity, such that what it means to be someone is to be a series of different performances in different contexts, without one underlying true self that stands above. And it shows itself in myriad of other ways, too, such as the love of eclecticism, a mixing of high and low culture, a championing of random juxtaposition, and so on. Secondly, postmodernity rejects the Enlightenment conception of truth as revealing everything while concealing nothing. Instead, the postmodern realizes that to shine a light on something is necessarily to thrust something else into darkness. As a result, what is absent is just as important to truth as what is present. Absence is thus a necessary part of reason, rationality, and reality itself. So my suggestion is that the themes of rejecting their narrative and embracing absence both help us to see exactly why this album remains so important as a work of art. First, then, a couple of quick words about the rejection of meta narrative. For the most part, my students today are not super interested in the Beatles. Their parents, even, were typically born after this album came out, and so they feel incredibly distant. My students' grandparents are, in general, baby boomers. The distance between baby boomers and millennials is great, but I sometimes ask them to imagine the distance between the Beatles and their grandparents. That is, the grandparents of John, Paul, George, and Ringo, because they were Victorians. While it's true that culture moves quickly today, the gulf between Victorian England and 1967's Summer of Love is nearly incomprehensible. The Beatles placing the fictional Sgt. Pepper band within the past meant placing it within a past that didn't seem to cohere into a continuous narrative for them. No wonder that the result is an even greater lack of coherence. Sergeant Pepper apparently taught the band to play in 1947, that is. But because Sergeant Pepper is clearly situated as an Edwardian figure playing a turn-of-the-century music hall, it means that Sergeant Pepper would already have been out of step with the times in 1947 when he was doing this teaching. The band is an anachronism before it's even an anachronism, a postmodern collective that accepts it must be informed by history, 
But at the same time, there's no meta-historical narrative that can make sense of that history. Every generation feels a generation gap, but that's because there truly is a gap and no continuous history. No wonder they've been going in and out of style. And no wonder the musicality of the album is as well an ahistorical yet historical melange. It's sometimes said that Sgt. Pepper is the first concept album. Though it's also sometimes said that this is an illusion. Because apart from the first two songs, and the next to last song, which brings the Sgt. Pepper theme song back again, there's no real connection among the rest of the songs that make up the bulk of the album. Paul once said, even, that the album coheres merely because the band has said it coheres. <laughs> Nothing could fit the postmodern spirit better. One's reminded of artist Robert Rauschenberg, who six years earlier had been asked to participate in a group show at a gallery in Paris owned by Iris Clare. Each artist was asked to submit a portrait of the gallery owner. On opening day, the gallery received a telegram from Rauschenberg that read, this is a portrait of Iris Clare, if I say so. So they hung it up on the wall. Sergeant Pepper coheres because the band and history say that it coheres, not because it has any necessary internal coherence. This is not a rock opera. This isn't the Who's Tommy. But coherence is in the ear of the listener. So given this, we're forced to create our own ways of hearing and seeing a whole, our own attempts at a gestalt. It's the embrace of postmodern eclecticity itself that we might say creates this cohesion. For instance, she's leaving home is a waltz, but it's a waltz for a new age, one in which a nostalgic musical form is put together with a story about a generational chasm in which a young woman is running away, likely to have an abortion. There is perhaps no greater marker of the distance between Victorian values and those of the summer of love. On top of this, Paul has said that John's added lyrics that were from the parents' point of view were meant as an official Greek chorus to the song, something from two and a half millennia ago. Further, She's Leaving Home is a three-four waltz that begins with a harp, played incidentally by the first woman musician ever to appear on a Beatles album, but it does not include a single moment of the Beatles themselves playing any instruments. None of the Beatles play an instrument for that track, George and Ringo weren't even around the studio for the recording. So if this is a Beatles song, it's even a song performed by Sgt. Pepper and his band, maybe, then we have to admit we don't even really know who's in that band, either band. And maybe that points to the fact that we never really can nail down identity, ever. Other songs, such as Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and Lovely Rita, are psychedelic celebrations of sex, drugs, and rock and roll to turning on in all of its many valences. Yet, even the often maligned When I'm 64 fits into the postmodern coherence if we see it as Paul asking whether we should be wary of the ethos of the rest of the album. Here, Paul is wondering how far the flower power hippie revolution will really go. Right now, it's all about free love and drugs and the floating downstream with their minds off, he seems to be saying. But is there a point when we revert to our parents' values, hoping only someday to be working in the garden while waiting for the grandkids to visit? The Victorians seem overthrown by the flower power uprising, but has it been a bourgeois revolution all along, always ready to revert to conservative values when the newly constructed teenager inevitably turns into a sexagenarian? Now, the postmodern rejection of meta-narrative can also be seen on the iconic cover of the album. And we have the album for sale out in the foyer, by the way, too, on vinyl, so you can get a copy if you want to before you leave. It's an ahistorical walk through history that constitutes the Lonely Hearts Club as a mix of figures with varying degree of fame and talent, all apparently there to witness the burial of the Beatles. Interestingly, it's not the old Beatles that are being buried. Those young lads are there at the gravesite, too. It's the Beatles in general that are being interred, the idea of a stable identity being laid to rest. The Beatles aren't pretending to be Sgt. Pepper's band. They were always already just pretending to be the Beatles all along anyway. Because there is nothing other than pretending, nothing other than performance, each with its own context and moment. George Martin claimed that the military motifs of the band were a, quote, send up of the US involvement in Vietnam a war that was in its bloody sixth year at the time. And this is surely true, but it's also surely not true. 
Sergeant Pepper was there in 1947 after World War II, and he was there in the Edwardian age right before World War I. And Sergeant Pepper is there in a dance hall, in a county fair, in a Salvation Army band. And he's here with us tonight. Those who look for hidden meaning in the album cover are always going to find it, but not because it unlocks some truer message that was underneath it all. We can't prove that Paul is dead, for instance, by looking at the hand of Shiva above his head singling him out, or the fact that he holds the only black instrument, or the clear indication that it's a four-string bass made out of flowers that sits on top of the grave, and Paul was, of course, the bass player in the band. Instead, meaning comes in embracing the lack of cohesion, the lack of a meta-history. All of the people who were alive in 1967 had to sign off on their images being used on that cover. Mae West refused at first, saying that she would never be in a Lonely Hearts Club because she never lacked for male companionship coming up to see her sometime. It took a letter from the Beatles explaining that literal meanings had no place on this album in order to get her to agree. Bob Dylan, we assume, had to sign a waiver too, though he slammed the album when it was released, saying, it's a very indulgent album. I don't think all that production was necessary. One reason that we have that life-size cardboard standee created for you tonight is so that you can have your photo taken as part of the cover as well. And this is precisely because you've always already been on the cover. Look closely to see yourself looking back. You've always been the caretaker, Mr. Torrance. Of course, marketing departments and capitalism tend to have their say too. John wanted Hitler and Jesus on the cover, but even with all the power of being John Lennon, those images were next. Which leads us to consider briefly what is absent on the album. Because if the postmodern notion of truth is true, then what is missing and unseen is constitutive of the meaning of the work of art. And so, apart from Hitler and Jesus, what is absent? Sgt. Pepper is an album of firsts. It was the first album that was packaged like an actual work of art. The first album to print all of the song lyrics on the back of the cover. The first album was special cut-out inserts so you could dress up as part of the band. The first album where the inner sleeve wasn't a simple blank paper to hold the record, but was a decorative part of the experience. Each part of the physical thing that was the Sgt. Pepper album was part of the experience. Perhaps most importantly, it was the very first record not to be pressed with bands of individual tracks. This is a material aspect of the vinyl itself that can't easily be translated to the technology of a CD or an MP3. Sgt. Pepper was one thing, a physical continuous whole in many different senses of that word, but it was a fractured whole. So there are six things that we can mention quickly that are absent from Sgt. Pepper. The first being separate tracks on the vinyl. No matter how much we might wish to think of getting better as being separate from fixing a hole, for instance, the material substrate of the album encourages us not to do that. Separation, it turns out, is also in the eye of the beholder. Second, there's the beautiful addition by John, who had the idea of putting a hidden groove with a hidden sound onto the end of the album. On the version of Sgt. Pepper released in the UK 50 years ago today, a 15 to 20 kilohertz tone is thus recorded along the spiral of what's called the run-out groove at the very end. Between that final drawn-out chord of a day in the life, which is an E major held for an astonishing 42 seconds, by the way, and the backwards melange of soundscape that appears a few seconds later, there is this secret inner track that cannot be heard by humans. In fact, in the average household, the only family member who would enjoy that track is a dog. How revolutionary it is to make music for non-humans. To think about what it might mean for dogs to be howling at the end of an album. To think about where the limits of family and audience traditionally get placed, and why they might be just as transitory as anything else in the postmodern world. Third, to return to the album cover, there was, upon its release, an immediate if hushed conversation about the fact that the album featured marijuana plants right there in plain sight in the middle of the album. But, just like Iris Clerk, we once again see what we want to see, this time projecting something absent onto something present. The plants on the photograph were common spiky greenhouse plants, with the final joke coming from the Beatles that they were all chosen from the genus Pepperonia. Fourth, 
Strawberry Fields Forever is absent from the album, but its absence influences everything else there. Although that song was recorded at the same time as the rest of the album, it was in fact the very first song recorded during the Sgt. Pepper sections. The label released Strawberry Fields with the B-side of Penny Lane in February of 1967. The missing fifth Beatle, George Martin, considered Strawberry Fields to be the most groundbreaking track in the Beatles' recording career ever, representing 55 hours of studio time, more than five hours of continuous work. With tape loops, reverse recordings, edited instrumentation, and a final Frankenstein version composed of multiple takes of the song, often in different keys and tempos, Strawberry Fields set the mood and agenda for Sgt. Pepper, and then promptly disappeared from the album, though we should still hear it ringing in our ears every time we listen to Sgt. Pepper. Fifth, we might ask whether or not the author of Mr. Kite, that song we just heard performed just a moment ago so wonderfully, is that author anywhere present on the album? In fact, who wrote Mr. Kite? The lyrics were taken verbatim from a poster for an 1843 circus that John Lennon found in an antique store. The melodies were echoes of calliopes, and for the middle part, George Martin found recordings of old steam organs, cut the tape into 15-inch lengths, then ordered the recording engineer to throw them in the air and splice them together randomly. A 1920s Dadaist technique that was being used in the first part of the 1960s by William S. Burroughs to create poetry, would later be used by David Bowie in the 70s to create such songs as Diamond Dogs, and Tom York in the 2000s to create Radiohead's Kid A. So, who wrote Mr. Kite? Even within the band, John claims to have written it completely by himself. Paul claims that he helped one afternoon and deserves writing credit on it, but then goes on to say that because of that circus poster, really, quote, the song just wrote itself. One might as well say that history wrote Mr. Kite, or random chance wrote Mr. Kite, or Mr. Kite wrote Mr. Kite, as well as say that Lennon and McCartney did. Which is all just a fancy way of saying that even in cases when it seems the author of something is clear and obvious, it never really is. There's no coherent, solitary, unified, stable author ever. What is absent from Sgt. Pepper just drives this point home, which leads us to the sixth and final absence on the album that I'll mention, the Beatles. They were, to be sure, always absent, even on Ed Sullivan, even from the time of Please Please Me, but it took Sgt. Pepper to make it clear, to make it obvious that the band had become another band, for the authors to dematerialize, the musicians and players to be unnamed, all identity to be fractured completely. It is not too much to hang all of this on a piece of music, on a piece of art, I think. And everything I've said doesn't preclude simply sitting down and listening to the music for enjoyment. As I've said for the last four years, our mantra at the DePaul Humanity Center is that we do serious work, but serious is not the opposite of fun. Leading an examined life, as Socrates taught us, is necessary for leading a good life. So tonight, I hope that we'll both celebrate Sgt. Pepper and continue to learn about what it is, that we'll have fun doing serious work together. Most importantly, I'm glad that we're here to do this together, that all of you are part of the band. And so officially and finally, welcome to all of you. Let's continue then with our next great musical act, and it's one that keeps the postmodern spirit going too, eclectically bl blending I Dig a Pony with a little help from my friends, and with their cover being inspired by Joe Cocker's cover of the song as well, I'm pleased to introduce to you the very talented Ryan and Connor Ash. This is Common Allies with Dig a Little Help from My Friends. You can send me a 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now to our first lecture of the evening. John Kimsey is an associate professor in DePaul School for New Learning and former DePaul Humanities Center fellow whose research interests include popular music studies, modern literature, and intersections between the two. His essays have appeared in journals such as Popular Music and Society, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and Interdisciplinary Literary Studies. His writings on the Beatles, music, and culture have appeared in such edited books as SUNY's Reading the Beatles, Cultural Studies, Literary Criticism, and the Fab Four, Ashgate's Sgt. Pepper and the Beatles, which is for sale out in the foyer apart from just the album. We have books by all of our speakers tonight for sale. And the Cambridge Companion to the Beatles. He's currently working on a chapter for a forthcoming anthology on the White Album, as well as a book entitled Just a Day Too Long, Music, Race, and Parchman Farm. Apart from being a noted scholar on the Beatles, John, along with his brother Jim and their band, play amazing original music as well as Beatles covers. We're lucky to have John here to lecture this evening, but you'll have to look for his band, Twisted Roots, and go hear them play soon sometime in Chicago. With his presentation, entitled Transcendent Masterpiece or Toy Balloon, The Debate About Sgt. Pepper, please join me in welcoming to the stage, John Kimsey. Thank you, Peter, and it's great to be here this evening with all you Sergeant Pepper aficionados. I, I see our mission here tonight is to turn 1967 up to 11, and so I think we're off to a good start with that. I want to begin with an artifact, and this is a press release that was put out by Apple Records in April 1970 to promote the Beatles' then new single, and it's entitled The Beatles as Nature Intended, and it reads as follows. Get Back is the Beatles' new single. It's the first Beatles record which is live as can be in this electronic age. There's no electronic whatchamacallit. Get Back is a pure springtime rock number. On the other side, there's an equally live number called Don't Let Me Down. And the press release goes on, but just in case you missed the point, it concludes with, in Get Back and Don't Let Me Down, you'll find the Beatles as nature intended. <clears throat> Now, I know this is PR, I know this is hype, and so there's a certain amount of cutesy, cheeky humor that's embedded in this document. But I also think there's a subtext that's serious, and I want to pause over that for a minute. It seems to me that the rhetoric of the press release sets up a binary opposition, where on one side, we might call it the plus side, we have lined up together nature, liveness, purity, and springtime. That all sounds good. And on the other side, what we might call the minus side, we have an intimidating, apparently unnameable technology, the enemy, it would seem, of all things live, the dreaded electronic whatchamacallit. Now, how, we might ask, did the Beatles get to this place? How is it that by 1970, the Beatles feel the need to reassure their audience that their music is pure, rocking, and, well, you know, live? And I want to suggest that they got here partly by taking seriously a critique of the work they had done during their psychedelic period, the kind of work that's epitomized in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, because there's always been what I call a minority report about Sgt. Pepper. This is a persistent chorus of voices which insists that the album is not all it's cracked up to be, that it's not all that great. This has never been a majority view, but as I say, it's been a persistent minority voice. We see an example of it here in the words of Ian Scholes from 1985. All the bad boys are gone, and all the slow-talking platter pushers in the dead of night. The ghosts of rock and roll used to haunt us as we drove, but that's over. That's rock and roll history, it's over. The Beatles killed it. Rock music used to be about dancing and parties, stolen kisses and fast cars. Then, in the late 60s, the Beatles pretended to be Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The producer over-orchestrated every track, the critics dubbed it a concept album, and the beginning of the end had begun. I want to zero in on this word, over-orchestrated, because for the members of the Nordy Report, Sgt. Pepper is over. It's over-orchestrated, over-produced, over-attended. It's just generally over the line. And it also means that rock and roll is over. That what was once an unpretentious working class music that performed a basic social function has now been turned into an art object in the Eurocentric sense. 
a thing to be admired by the mind, not danced to by the body. And as a, an aside, I want to say that I, I think this argument leaves out the question of whether or not you can dance with your mind, which is a question we might want to take up tonight and look forward to. At any rate, the locus classicus of the Minority Report view is the very negative review of Sgt. Pepper that was published in the New York Times in mid-June 1967 by the rock critic Richard Goldstein, who famously described the album as dazzling but ultimately fraudulent. And he is in the overcant. He thinks that in Sgt. Pepper, style overwhelms substance, tone overtakes meaning. And to get that across, he invokes metaphors of staging, spicing, and ornamentation repeatedly. Thus we hear of elaborate musical prop work, a melodramatic saga with saucy accompaniment, a voice that oozes over the melody like melted cheese, an honest vision ruined by the background that seeks to enhance it, an engaging curio drenched in reverb, echo, and other studio distortions, and a bag of slicks and tricks, now, in every instance, the supposedly lowly member of some normative hierarchy has gotten uppity and moved out of its proper station. And I must say, too, that when I read that list, I'm often reminded of Stanley Kowalski describing Blanche Dubois in A Streetcar Named Desire. Now, interestingly, a similar view of psychedelia was voiced by John Lennon himself, along with Yoko Ono, a few years later, in 1972, in the lengthy interview with Jan Winner of Rolling Stone that was eventually published in book form as Lennon Remembers. And this was on the occasion of uh, John's first solo LP, uh, Plastic Ono Band. Uh, they were promoting this. And at this time, John Yoko had embraced an aesthetic of radical minimalism. And in the course of the interview, Yoko says, the thing is, the psychedelic age brought about this music with lots of decorative sounds. So decorative. John's new stuff is like, instead of medium is the message, which was the psychedelic age, he's like, the message is the medium. And it's really the message. Because it was so important, he didn't need any decorative sound or decorativeness about it. And later in the interview, John says, if it's real, it's simple usually. And if it's simple, it's true. And this leads into a discussion of musical simplicity versus musical complexity. And as you might imagine, musical complexity has made the villain of the piece. And Yoko says, the downfall of classical music is that it went further and further away from the heartbeat. Heartbeat is 4-4, four, four, and it goes, and she demonstrates. And they started 1-2-3 and all that, and then, and John chimes in, perversion. So here, everything is put under the sign of animal nature. Heartbeat becomes the ultimate horizon of musical value. Any rhythm then deemed complex can be dismissed as merely cerebral or a betrayal of the body, as decadent, as against nature. Now, the binary is implied here, style versus substance, medium versus message, complicated versus simple, simple excuse me, decorative versus plain, are, are, I think, variations on another one described here by Stanley Fish. The quarrel between philosophy and rhetoric survives every sea change in the history of Western thought, continually presenting us with the skewed choice between the plain, unvarnished truth straightforwardly presented and the powerful but insidious appeal of fine language, language that has transgressed the limits of representation and substituted its own forms for the forms of reality. In aligning themselves with the supposedly simple truth, John and Yoko cast psychedelia in the role of mere rhetoric, a move that is itself highly rhetorical. Because although they're talking about music, the deep structure of the thought of Goldstein, Lennon, and Ono is philosophy's old problem with rhetoric, with those design elements in discourse that empower communicators with supposedly dubious designs on you and me. Now, it seems to me that a rejoinder to the style or well substance argument has been provided in recent years by the musicologist Walter Everett, who has written, the Beatles' call to the imagination was placed by musical elements just as much as it was by words. But whereas values such as melody, counterpoint, harmony, rhythm, and formal construction are sometimes crucial in such expression, the Beatles most directly parallel the acutely detailed sensory world of their lyrics in the realm of tone color, timbre, 
Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds stands as the quintessential psychedelic recording, with its timbres just as essential as are its innovative harmonic structure, rhythmic relationships, and formal design in transporting the listener from this world into another. So Everett is here talking about, yes, timbre, tone color, a musical element that's uh, often considered secondary, supplemental, might say uh, sometimes merely decorative. But he's saying it is with this musical element that the Beatles most strongly placed their call to the imagination. He's saying that this supposedly supplemental secondary register comes to the center and becomes just as essential as melody, harmony, and rhythm in transporting the listener from this world into another. A very, I think, uh, thought-provoking suggestion. I want to return for a moment to Goldstein because his conclusion is interesting. He finds one thing to praise about Sgt. Pepper, and that is the track, A Day in the Life. But he ends by saying, what a shame that A Day in the Life is only a coda to an otherwise undistinguished collection of work. We need the Beatles, not as cloistered composers, but as companions. And they need us. In substituting the studio conservatory for an audience, they have ceased being folk artists, and the change is what makes their new album a monologue. Now, the Beatles is folk artists. This may seem a quaint notion here in 2017, where we can join the Boulevardiers on the Vegas Strip and be wowed by the pricey spectacle Beatles Love, or open the millennial issue of Variety and Show Business Bible and find listed there the top 100 entertainment icons of the 20th century and find the Beatles at the top or most of the poppermost. These are not your typical venues for folk art. But in the late 60s, the notion that rock music was a kind of folk music, that it had arisen, it was a, that it was a vernacular form that had arisen from a community and was for a certain community, was commonplace among rock critics. Now, Simon Frith, in 1981, Simon Frith, who was a rock critic but who is also a sociologist, published an article called The Magic That Can Set You Free, <clears throat> the, the Ideology of the Folk and the Myth of the Rock Community. And in this article, he observed that the rock is folk music argument assumed that rock music was an authentic reflection of experience and that it represented the experience of a community. But, he pointed out, there was no independent, non-musical description of the rock community, and no account of how such a community came to make music for itself. Rather, the existence of the community was inferred from a given piece of music, such that if a song or record, record exhibited the necessary signs of authenticity, then it was taken as the sign of a real community. But the signs of authenticity derived not from sociological information, but from a set of musical conventions now, what Frith is saying here is that, in rock culture at least, authenticity is less a state of being than it is a species of rhetoric. He's not saying that authenticity is meaningless because people do believe in it and they use it to map their experiential worlds. But he is saying that in rock, authenticity is a myth in the sense of the term myth coined by Roland Bard, which is to say it's a discursive construct whose rhetorical origins have been forgotten such that it can masquerade as natural fact. So I want to probe this notion of rock authenticity for a moment. And I'll be helped here by the thoughts of the popular music studies scholar, Kier Kitely. Now, Kitely has observed that although rock seems to subsume a blue million different genres, um, they all share one common core value, and that is an emphasis on authenticity. Now, he would hasten to add that different rock genres may have radically opposed definitions of what counts as authenticity, but, and I think he's correct in this, they all affirm authenticity as key. He notes that the concern with authenticity underlines a general anxiety about the status of the modern self as forces of mechanization, mass production, and rapid social change were seen as posing a threat to community, tradition, and meaning. And that out of this, there developed a critique of mass society centered on questions of mediation and alienation, authenticity and community, conformity and complicity, questions that were taken up by rock culture itself. So that in the 20th century, the alienation of music and musicians has largely been understood in terms of mediation, of those things which interfere with an ideal of direct communication between artist and audience. 
And for Goldstein, the members of the minority report, this is part of the problem with Sergeant Pepper. Goldstein sees the Beatles as, he says, what a shame they've ceased being folk artists. He sees the Beatles as having turned their backs on their audience. And this creates interference with this ideal of direct communication. And of course, it is true in an important sense that the Beatles had turned their backs on their audience for the Pepper Project, if by their audience we mean those screaming, the screaming Beatle maniacs, bless them, who had by summer 1966 driven the Beatles from the stage. But there's a further wrinkle here. Kiley argues, and again, I think he's onto something here, that there are two broad families of authenticity within rock culture, one which he labels romantic, the other which he labels modernist. What romantics see sincere, unmediated expression as essential, modernists believe their first commitment is less to reaching an audience than to being true to their own artistic integrity. So under the modernist ethos, the rocker is in pursuit of a project of self-realization. And in that pursuit, the audience itself may provide interference, such that it may be appropriate, it may be, so to speak, authentic for the modernist rocker to turn away from the audience. It may even be possible for the modernist rocker to say, embrace mediation itself, or furthermore, embrace what's sometimes conceived as authenticity is the opposite, artifice. Although in rock artifice, says Kitely, uh, we usually have not artifice for the sake of artifice, but rather a deliberate rejection of the romantic mode of authenticity in favor of a complex and nuanced modernist strategy of authenticity in which the performer's ability to shape imaginary worlds rather than be shaped by this one is foregrounded. Now, interestingly, Sergeant Pepper was received as providing just the right sort of music for restoring the idea of community that was key to the idea of rock as folk music. Here are the oft-quoted words of Langdon Winner. At the time Sergeant Pepper was released, I happened to be driving across country on Interstate 80. In each city where I stopped for gas or food, Laramie, Oglala, Moline, South Bend, the melodies wafted in from some far off transistor radio or portable hi-fi. It was the most amazing thing I've ever heard. For a brief while, the irreparably fragmented consciousness of the West was unified, at least in the minds of the young. Now here, electronic whatchamacallit is no problem. The pervasive electronic media have helped turn Sgt. Pepper into the axis pole of the swinging 60s. They've made it ubiquitous here. And um, at least, and they're essential to constructing what Winter envisions as uh, the community here. Now I want to return to one final point that's often raised by the members of the Minority Court, and this is that Sergeant Pepper represents a fall from grace. And this view constructs a, a, a vision of quote unquote primitive rock and roll um, that is supposed to be purely spontaneous, uh, unselfconscious, and innocent. And with Sergeant Pepper, the Beatles have supposedly fallen out of the state of grace, you know, into sorry self-consciousness, um, pseudo-sophistication, artiness, what Goldstein calls the bad magic of production, and so on. And the John the Baptist of the primitive rock and roll ideology is the influential rock critic Lester Bangs, who in 1980 wrote, the point is that rock and roll, as I see it, is the ultimate populist art form, democracy in action, because it's true. Anybody can do it. Learn three chords on a guitar and you've got it. Don't worry whether you can sing or not. For performing rock and roll, or punk rock, or call it any damn thing you please, there's only one thing you need, nerve. Rock and roll is an attitude, and if you've got the attitude, you can do it, no matter what anybody says. <clears throat> Believing that is one of the things that punk rock is about. Rock is for everybody. It should be so implicitly anti-elitist that the question of whether somebody is qualified to perform it should never arise. But it did. In the 60s, of course. 
And maybe this was one reason why the 60s may not have been so all fired great as we give them credit for. Because in the 60s, rock and roll began to think of itself as an art form. Rock and roll is not an art form. Rock and roll is a raw whale from the bottom of the guts. Dude. <laughs> um, it seems to me that Bang's attitude-driven everyman blissfully spared the ravages of skill or self-consciousness is a rock version of the Rousseauian noble savage. And I submit to you that this particular myth of noble savagery is every bit as dubious and deconstructible as all the other myths of noble savagery going back to the time of Rousseau. But the larger point for us right now is that the Beatles themselves took a version of this argument seriously so that in January 1969, they came together to pursue a project they called Get Back, the goal of which was to get back to the roots get back to playing good old rock and roll, and get back to this prelapsarian state they had supposedly fallen out of when they undertook the Pepper Project. Now, strangely enough, at the same time that they were pursuing that project, they also contracted with a film company to have their every breath and utterance movement filmed virtually 24-7. Almost in what seems a self-sabotaging way, they introduced this element of electronic monitoring. And surprise, surprise, it proved to be profoundly alienating for them, such that they abandoned the Get Back project after a month and left it for dead, left it to turn into the fiasco that eventually became Let It Be. It was as if in pursuing one myth, the return to the primal garden, they had enacted another, which was the revenge of the electronic whatchamacallit. Now, they waited a few months and then came back together again for one final masterpiece. And this was the Abbey Road LP. And for this, they brought George Martin back into the producer's chair. And they reaffirmed the ethos of modernist innovation and high production that they had affirmed on Sgt. Pepper. Or, I would say, with this, they finally did get back to where they once belonged. Thank you. Remarkably, Bill's published nine books, including Matrix and Line, Ethical Marxism, The Categorical Imperative of Liberation, and The Radical Project. Bill's work on such figures as Marx, Sartre, Derrida, and Badu have garnered him an international reputation as an original scholar, but so too have his books on music, where Bill puts complicated theory into exceptionally clear practice. 
These works include avant rock, experimental music from the Beatles to Bjork, and that's on sale out in the foyer. Listening to the Future, the time of progressive rock, 1968 to 1978, as well as the music of Yes, structure and vision in progressive rock. Recently, Bill has moved toward finding a way to bridge Buddhist and Maoist thought. He's an accomplished bass player himself, and he'll be performing, along with his band behind the locked door, at the conclusion of his presentation. It's my pleasure to present to you, with his lecture entitled, So Many Doors, Thoughts in the Margins of Sergeant Pepper, Professor Bill Martin. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Peter and the Humanities Center uh, staff for putting on this great program. Um, it's really exciting to be a part of it. I'm a longtime lover of the Beatles. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to the other musicians we're going to play with. Uh, really a great group. I heard all of them play during the sound check, sound check, and it's really an honor to play with them. And uh, also to uh, Steve, who's working sound. Uh, thanks for doing that and doing a great job. I want to dedicate this talk to a great rock musician uh, who died last week uh, on uh, Saturday, uh, the great Greg Allman. And not to intellectualize this, yeah, uh, not to intellectualize this loss, but I think the Allman Brothers Band are an interesting group to think about in relation to the later Beatles and the vast influence of Sgt. Pepper because they're one of the very few great groups I can think of that have almost absolutely nothing in common with the Beatles. And I think that's a very interesting thing because the Beatles were such a, so definitive of their era that everything else either defined itself in terms of the Beatles or against the Beatles, such as, say, the Velvet Underground. Um, but uh, the Allman Brothers were doing their own thing that was quite unique and beautiful in its own right. And uh, to me, it's a very interesting thing to think about. So what remains to be said about the Beatles? Let's start with a very large claim. The Beatles opened so many doors. In fact, they opened as many or more doors as anyone ever did. Of the Beatles' 12 albums, the one that opened the most doors was Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. There is still much, in fact, to say about the Beatles and Sgt. Pepper, and here I'll confine myself to two interrelated subjects. First, what the mature Beatles mean in terms of a vibrant culture, and second, the power of the later Beatles in terms of form. In this spring of 2017, we are 50 years since the Sgt. Pepper album, the most important album in the history of rock music, and I'll just make that big claim as well. Sgt. Pepper came into a time when rock music was very important to many millions, when rock music was deeply intermixed with a worldwide culture of upheaval, rebellion, and even revolution. Undoubtedly, Sgt. Pepper is a crucial cultural document at the same time, Sgt. Pepper is ultimately a piece of music in a history of music, and the Beatles were a band of musicians, which is a very hard thing to get us to focus on sometimes, but they were a band, they were musicians. Where does Sgt. Pepper stand in this history of music, I mean? My own experience of the Beatles goes back more than 50 years to February, to February of 1964, when my parents and sister and I watched them on the Ed Sullivan Show. I remember saving up my allowance so that my mom, my sister, and I could walk over from the apartment we lived in in that summer to the nearby Zare store so I could buy a Beatle doll. Which one did I get? Stay tuned. The Beatles have not only opened doors for me since that time, but in recent years it has really sunk into me that in one way or another almost every door that was ever opened for me, musically, culturally, intellectually, politically, leads back to the Beatles. This is remarkable, or it would be, except I think upon reflection, many others would come to a similar conclusion. The 60s generation and others for some time after learned about musicianship from the Beatles. They learned that they could improve as musicians. We learned also that it is possible to be creative and experimental in the context of rock music. We learned about other things, from fashion to psychedelic drugs to Eastern religion, 
to Chuck Berry and other great African-American rock musicians who were the originators of rock music. The Beatles invented the rock band as it later came down to us, a self-contained ensemble of musician composers, the groups that they we used to say. For very many of, us, many of us, the Beatles opened the doors to Western classical music, from Bach to John Cage, jazz from Louis Armstrong to Cecil Taylor, and Indian classical music. The Beatles were an integral and highly significant part of so much of what we call the 60s. Take away the role that the Beatles played in this great period of innovation and change, and the picture is very different. Try to imagine the 60s without the Beatles. After the 60s, for how long did the Beatles go on? Are they still going on? One argument about rock music is that it comes at a time when the interrelated phenomena of the teenager and consumer society are becoming normative for certain societies and certainly for the United States. Some argue, and certainly for the UK and Japan and a few others, some argue that rock music never gets beyond these origins. It is always adolescent music trapped in the logic of the commodity. All musical forms go through development and evolution, though we might say that the ones that become an art go through some kind of revolution, too. Perhaps, though, the origins of rock music stand in the way of its growing up and becoming adults, so to speak. The Beatles are the sine qua non of many things, but the originators of rock music were the sine qua non of the Beatles. Sister Rosetta Tharp, Little Richard, Bo Diddley, Jerry Lee Lewis, and of course Chuck Berry. Most Beatles, Beatles aficionados would say that the path to maturity fully opened up with, with rubber sole and revolver, with Sgt. Pepper marking a point of consolidation, and with plenty of very good songs coming in the early years as well. Did rock music develop beyond song and dance, so to speak, into concert music, or music primarily for listening? If it did, then Sgt. Pepper marks the real turning point. It's well known that in the period of entering musical maturity, the Beatles and the Beach Boys were in a friendly competition with each other. In 1966, the Beach Boys released the great Pet Sounds album, massively influential, a new stage in the development of rock music, at least. Pet Sounds is not dance music, and though it is a collection of songs, it is better understood as a song cycle. Sgt. Pepper was the response to Pet Sounds, and to make a long and very interesting but also tragic story short, Brian Wilson asked himself how he was going to respond to that, and he had a nervous breakdown trying. Certainly, this tells us something about people intensely concerned with creativity, and not very much with teenage or commercial concerns. In the more immediate vicinity of rock music, Sgt. Pepper opened the doors to three creative trends. One, I call Pepperism, the second, long-form concept albums, and third, progressive rock. I call Pepperism those albums made in the 12 months after Sgt. Pepper that were a direct response to the Beatles album. Among those albums are The Grateful Dead's Anthem of the Sun, Simon and Garfunkel's Bookends, and The Jimi Hendrix Experience's Axis Bold as Love. It's also the case, by the way, and I just think Hendrix was probably the coolest guy ever, that Jimi Hendrix was playing the opening theme of, Sar theme of Sgt. Pepper on stage within a few days of Sgt. Pepper's release. My favorite Pepperist album, uh, just to tick some people off, is the Rolling Stones, their Satanic Majesty's Request, and it's famous that uh, not only do many Rolling Stones fans not like this album, but the Stones themselves don't like it, and they, they've never said anything good about it. To me, it's the dark side of Sgt. Pepper, and I really enjoy listening to it. Second, the Beatles opened the door to a general orientation toward creativity and experimentation, a breaking with what I call blues orthodoxy in rock music, and many, other, and many other excellent works came through this door. For example, Tommy, that Peter mentioned by The Who. St. Pepper uh, continued to give psychedelic rock a boost, and it can be readily acknowledged that the Beatles were themselves inspired by the experimentation of Pink Floyd and others. So they were listening. Everybody was listening. This was just a great time for people listening to each other and learning from each other. And uh, of course, London was the center of that. Third, progressive rock, especially set sail from Sgt. Pepper. Robert Fripp, who convenes the band called King Crimson when he believes there's King Crimson music to be played, has said that when he first heard A Day in the Life, a world of musical possibilities opened up to him. It would be silly to call the music of King Crimson, yes, Henry Cow, Magma, and a good many others simply pop music or music for entertainment purposes only. It would be silly to call this music teenage music. 
For one thing, it's not that entertaining, actually. My point is simply that the Beatles were concerned with what all real artists are concerned with, namely creativity, formal innovation, inventing something new. In their mature period, this seems to be the focus exclusively. Their success in this can be measured in part by all the great music they inspire. Obviously, the Beatles and their great producer, George Martin, were at the cutting edge of what the recording studio can do. It's not an exaggeration to say that the Beatles were the leaders for every kind of music regarding the art of the studio. St. Pepper, Sergeant Pepper rather, especially represented numerous major breakthroughs in this art. Furthermore, in a time such as now, when pop music is almost nothing but production, we might say that George Martin accomplished the reversal of what Walter Benjamin said about the aura coming off the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. He put the aura back on. Let's explore some questions of form with references to two philosophers well known for their formalism. Theodore Adorno, who lived from 1903 to 1973, and Alain Badiou, born 1937 and still with us today. Both are skeptical about rock music as music. Rock music for Adorno is just giving a beat to this logic, um, to, is just giving a beat to the logic of the commodity. It cannot give us a glimpse of a world beyond that logic. In order to achieve such a glimpse, a formal innovation is required. Such an innovation causes a disruption in what Adorno calls the spell that we are under in a world of consumer capitalism. Badiou's view is not so different except that he, unlike Adorno, appreciates jazz, he does not despise rock music, as so much as think that it is not real music, instead it is entertainment music, and in that category, Badiou recognizes the Beatles are the best of it. For Badiou, rock music is entirely derivative of other kinds of music, and therefore it's not capable of innovation. How might an advocate of Sgt. Pepper as an important and innovative piece of music respond to these criticisms? Well, so in Adorno, there's a certain suspicion of melody. Adorno is suspicious of anything that people can just latch onto and feel good about. The problem for Adorno is that such aesthetic elements, even catharsis, play the role of reconciling people to a terrible world. And I, in fact, do think that there are some songs on Sgt. Pepper that have this problem. Exhibit number one being Paul McCartney's When I'm 64. This may be sacrilege to some, but some creative re reshuffling of the album would fix this. And uh, that's where I feel that it's very unfortunate uh, that Sergeant, that uh, Strawberry Fields didn't make it on the album. By the way, I've actually been to uh, Strawberry Field, and I've been to Penny Lane, and uh, uh, many other places around Liverpool, and, uh, and uh, I don't hesitate to admit that I cried just being at Strawberry Field. I felt so privileged and happy, um, and also a little melancholy about it. Um, so what, to second, when it comes to musical form, I think Adorno and Badiou are a bit narrow, focusing too much on just the notes, so to speak, and how they are deployed melodically, harmonically, and in counterpoint. Other basic elements of music are given a bit of a short shrift, rhythm and tempo, timbre, tone color, dynamics, duration, silence. There is also what can be called the blurring of the boundary between so-called music and so-called noise. Alain Badiou asks what there is, formally speaking, in Beatles music that was not already innovated in Western classical music and jazz. That's a fair question. A short answer is that here is that there is much rock music, much Beatles music, and much music of Sgt. Pepper that makes use of these elements in ways that are truly creative and not just for rock music. Third, most rock music is either in song form or some expansion of song form. We should hear we should bear this in mind when strained comparisons to classical composers are made. You know, Beethoven wrote songs, he wrote symphonies and he wrote songs. Let's compare songs to songs. Is it not clear that fixing the whole Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, the latter reminiscent of the whimsical songs of Francois Poulenc, are really good songs? And fourth, as for long form, certainly there are pieces in the progressive rock and other creative rock fields that either played in piano reduction or orchestrated for classical music instruments are obviously serious and powerful works. Beatles music is mostly not long form, but if you take their three longer songs, A Day in the Life, uh, I Am the Walrus, and Strawberry Fields, all of which were part of the Sgt. Pepper sessions, because at the end of the sessions, they just kept going and recording the stuff that became Magical Mystery Tour, and, and I Am the Walrus was part of that. And then add to that what the lads used to refer to as their long song on the second side of Abbey Road, from You Never Give Me Your Money to the End. It seems to me 
that these are uh, excellent pieces of music that can be appreciated by anybody who cares about good music, whatever the type. A Day in the Life is highly original. What else is like it? When it comes to the status of rock music as music, this is a very important question. And fifth and finally, I cannot take this to be the, I, I take this to be the most important point. Western classical music cannot swing like jazz. If it did swing that way, it would be jazz. Miles Davis and others, many of whom were alumni of Miles' later groups, such as John McLaughlin, Herbie Hancock, etc., did some great things with the fusion of jazz and rock. But they don't rock. There's a certain energy I hear in jazz that I don't hear in classical music. And there's another type of energy I hear in great rock music that I don't hear in jazz or classical music. Is there a way to formalize this notion of energy or whatever you want to call it? I'd like to see rock musicologists, so to speak, work on this question more. Um, I can't uh, leave the topic of Sgt. Pepper without saying something and giving a shout out about the great Ringo Starr, such a superb and creative musician. And I really originally thought I would just spend half the talk or more just talking about how much I love Ringo. There's something very remarkable uh, to think about here. Not every record the Beatles released is perfect. Uh, my own opinion is that uh, Revolver and Abbey Road come closest and that they're the best Beatle albums, but that Sgt. Pepper is still the, still the uh, most important Beatles album. Um, not everything the individual Beatles play on every album is perfect, but there's an exception. Ringo Starr. Everything he plays is exactly right. His drumming is so well considered, so creative, so right for whatever piece he is playing. Contrary to the views of people who don't know squat, frankly, Ringo is certainly a technically very good drummer, but it's his perfection that stands beyond whatever can be said about his or anyone else's technique. Recently, Yoko Ono has spoken to the brilliance of Ringo's musicianship and how fortunate the Beatles were to have him. Absolutely right. And it was the Ringo doll that my mom bought for me on that hot summer day in Atlanta in 1964. One could say that this debate will go on, except it's not clear that many people care about questions such as this anymore. That old question that we used to drive ourselves crazy with when I was in college. I mean, we'd stay up half the night in the dormitory talking about the Beatles versus the Stones, and the, you know, and it, it, it's almost unimaginable that there's anybody in a dorm room right now at DePaul University, for example, uh, arguing over that. Um, uh, it's just become sort of an old person thing to say, and you know, well, here I am, almost 64. Uh, we would stay up all night uh, with these arguments. Uh, most people today regard the Beatles and the Rolling Stones as much old people's music as they do Beethoven or John Coltrane. Um, and it's a backhanded compliment, I think, in this time of postmodern capitalism to say that this is just as much a post-Beatles as it is a post-Beethoven world. It's a world in which important art, or anything important, has great difficulty in appearing as important, except in the margins. Now, isn't that always the case? I think so, but there does seem to be something different, and I call it postmodern capitalism, neoliberal economics, etc., however these things combine, about the doors that at present are closed. So something different about the doors now that seem to be closed. With Sgt. Pepper, we have a great example of a moment when the margins were in many ways central to humanity's dreams and aspirations. What can open doors again? Almost certainly a more general opening in politics and culture will be required, though exactly what this will look like no one can say. But we can still learn from that period of global upheaval of the late 1960s, one of the greatest creative results of which was Sgt. Pepper. There is then far more to continuing to think with Sgt. Pepper, think with Sgt. Pepper, than a mere exercise in nostalgia. In this sense, the Beatles and Sgt. Pepper will continue to open doors. Thank you for listening.
studies in history and chair of the Department of History at the University of Minnesota. She's the past president of the Organization of American Historians and the American Studies Association. A well-known scholar of history, especially women's history in the 20th century, Elaine's books include America and the Pill, A History of Promise, Peril, and Liberation, Homeward Bound, American Families in the Cold War Era, and that's the book that's for sale out in the lobby. Barren in the Promised Land, the Childless Americans and the Pursuit of Happiness, Pushing the Limits, American Women 1940 to 1961, and Great Expectations, Marriage and Divorce in Post-Victorian America. She's written for many popular media outlets as well, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Ms. Magazine, Daily Beast, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Elaine is also a recent recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Guggenheim Foundation, and she's currently writing a book exploring the quest for security in America. Sure to be a simple topic now that America is great again. <laughs> it's a real honor for us to have Elaine with us tonight from Minnesota to speak on the topic of Sgt. Pepper, the Beatles, and the New World of the 1960s. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Elaine May. here 
that there were proto-feminist themes in the Beatles' personas and in their songs. Although they never identified themselves as a feminist band, they expressed many of the sensibilities that were central to the feminist movement. That movement was just beginning to take shape in the early 1960s when the Beatles came on the scene. The early 60s was a time of optimism, hope, and what many young people saw as positive social change. In the South, courageous young civil rights activists risked their lives and lost their lives for the cause of racial equality. In the face of horrible and tragic violence, nonviolent protesters stood strong. For them, the early 1960s was not a time of innocence, but it was a time of hope. For others, especially white teenagers in the North, it was an exhilarating moment. John F. Kennedy was president, symbolizing a new era in youthful leadership. Rebellion against white middle class conformity of the 1950s took relatively mild forms, such as student protests against mandated dress codes and hair length in high schools, including my own high school. Enter the Beatles with their gender-bending personas and their sweet songs of love. The early Beatles, with their hair dangling in manicured mops below their ears, represented a new possibility for boys and young men to abandon the strict rules for masculine looks, attire, and behavior. They sang songs begging for love, like, please, please me, I want to hold your hand, love me do, and P.S., I love you. The Beatles themselves, as well as their music, swept youth, especially white youth, off their feet, sometimes quite literally. Fast forward to 1967, the year of the Sgt. Pepper release. Much had happened to shape the innocence and optimism of the early 1960s. President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. Cities erupted in racial violence in the mid-1960s. The founding of the Black Panther Party in 1966 shifted the tone of the civil rights movement from nonviolence to militants. The Vietnam War became increasingly unpopular and the anti-war movement became huge. The backlash against the protests and the counterculture led to Ronald Reagan being elected governor of California in 1966 and would elect Richard Nixon as president the year after the release of the Sgt. Pepper album. The Beatles moved with the times, expressing their unique form of social commentary. For the remainder of my 20 minutes, I will examine particular lyrics of a few, a few of the Beatles songs that opened up new ways of thinking about gender and relationships in popular music. I will also look at a few key moments in the life of the band outside the performance stage and the recording studio. In many ways, their messages were astonishing for the time. In terms of gender, the Beatles addressed issues in their songs that the feminist movement was just beginning to raise. Looking at some of the songs in Sgt. Pepper, let's start with Getting Better All the Time. The first verse is an apology for, quote, getting mad at my school. You're holding me down, turning me around, filling me up with your rules. Yet in the early 1960s, it was the Beatles who challenged those very rules and inspired high school students to get mad at their schools, especially the rules that mandated gender attire and behavior. But it's the later verses of the song that are really radical where the, quote, angry young man, as he describes himself in the song, the angry young man of the past now admits and apologizes for acts of domestic violence. At the time, the term was hardly recognized. But listen to the words. I used to be cruel to my woman. I beat her and kept her apart from the things that she loved. Man, I was mean, but I'm changing my scene and I'm doing the best that I can. These are remarkable lyrics for a, pop, for a pop song in 1967, or for any time for that matter, and to be sung by a male 
in autobiographical confession is really quite astonishing. Let's take a look at a more playful side of gender bending in lovely Rita Metermaid. The song recounts a young man's infatuation with Rita the meter maid, who is not depicted as a femme fatale, a submissive sexy woman, or a date who will allow her escort to treat her as a dependent. Her uniform, quote, made her look a little like a military man. And then the singer asks, discreetly, when are you free to take some tea with me? He took her out to dinner and tried to win her, got the bill, and Rita paid it. He didn't score that night. Took her home and nearly made it, sitting on a sofa with a sister or two. No glorious conquest, that's for sure. The Beatles also took on some deep and emotional issues involving family dynamics, aging, and loneliness. One of the most poignant songs that explore these issues is She's Leaving Home, a ballad sung in the voice of a mother who discovers that her daughter has quietly left home to find adventure and independence. I'm not sure, Peter, about the abortion thing. We can talk about that later. But definitely to find adventure and independence. The mother breaks down and cries when she reads the letter her daughter left and tells her husband, our baby's gone. She sees her daughter's escape as a cruel act against her parents. Why would she treat us so thoughtlessly? How could she do this to me? The mother describes all they did for her. We never thought of ourselves. We struggled hard to get by. What did we do that was wrong? We didn't know it was wrong. <coughs> This deep reflection of the pain of parents who believed they were doing everything right for their child is contrasted with what the daughter was missing in her life. Fun is the one thing that money can't buy, something inside that was always denied for so many years. We also see the daughter's perspective. Stepping outside, she is free, and soon, she is far away, waiting to keep the appointment she made, meeting a man from the motor trade. And the poignant refrain pointing to the daughter's loneliness. She's leaving home after living alone for so many years. There are no villains in this song. The parents are well-meaning and broken-hearted that their daughter left. The daughter has been lonely, living at home with her parents lacking fun and adventure, and now she is free. No other pop artists took up the deep emotional issues at the center of the generation gap, affecting so many families of the 1960s, and with sensitivity to both the older and the younger generation. The Beatles took up loneliness in another song, perhaps one of their saddest, Eleanor Rigby which was released as a single and also on the Revolver album in 1966. Eleanor Rigby's dreams of a wedding she never had. She waits at the window, wearing the face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? The song wonders about all the lonely people. Where do they all belong? Eleanor dies in the church and was buried along with her name, nobody came. Father Mackenzie, who wrote a sermon no one will hear. He was also lonely. No one comes near. Look at him working, darning his stocks in the night when there's nobody there. What does he care? When he finishes burying Eleanor, he wipes the dirt from his hands and walks from the grave. No one was saved. If you pull out the lyrics from the music and listen to the poetry, it's, it's really profound. The ode to loneliness has no happy ending. Neither Eleanor nor Father Mackenzie find friendship or love. They live their lives in loneliness. It's a profoundly sad song 
and remarkable for its depth. Beatles songs that confronted loneliness were not the only songs to take a look at aging, and aging was not necessarily a source of sadness and loneliness. Maybe when I'm 64 it was much maligned. I, I never maligned it. I never knew it was maligned. And when I'm 64, the Beatles look at young love and ask how it will stand the test of time. Will you still feed me? Will you still need me when I'm 64? You'll be older too. And if you say the word, I could stay with you. And they sing that old age will not necessarily be grim. Maybe it is traditional, but it's definitely not grim. Every summer we can rent a cottage on the Isle of Wight. If it's not too dear, we shall scrimp and save. Grandchildren on your knee, Vera, Chuck, and Dave. And the promise for a lasting love is really at the heart of this song. Give me your answer, fill in a form, mine forevermore. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? The Beatles explored the issues surrounding relationships in other songs as well. In 1965, they released We Can Work It Out, a song that examines tensions and arguments in a relationship and how the inability to see things from the other person's point of view can ruin a relationship. Try to see it my way, they sing. Do I have to keep on talking till I can't go on while you see it your way? Run the risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone. And then insisting, think of what you're saying. You can get it wrong and still think you, you can get it wrong and still you think that it's all right. Think of what I'm saying. We can work it out and get it straight or say good night. <laughs> Up to this point, the singer is self-righteous, blaming his partner for an unwillingness to see things his way. But then he ponders. Life is very short, and there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. Still, he persists that his perspective is the right one. Try to see it my way. But then he acknowledges that he might not necessarily be right, and that his partner might, in fact, see it another way. Only time will tell if I'm right or I am wrong while you see it your way. There's a chance that we might fall apart before too long. But then the hopeful refrain, we can work it out, although when the song ends, they haven't yet worked it out. By 1967, the Beatles take up the issue of love in a more global sense in Within You, Without You on the Sgt. Pepper album. In this song, they move beyond the two people arguing in We Can Work It Out. They begin with the space between us all and the people who hide themselves behind a wall of illusion. They never glimpse the truth, then it's far too late when they pass away. With that opening reminder that life is short and we should not waste it on illusions, they continue talking about the love we all could share. When we find it, try our best to hold it there. With our love, we could save the world if they only knew. They urge the listener to recognize that life will not come to them. They need to grasp it. Try to realize it's all within yourself. No one else can make you change. And here they almost preach about the insignificance of any one human being. And to see you're really only very small, and life goes on within you and without you. They point to the ways in which people ruin their lives by their material wants, rather than appreciating the need for honest love as a way to heal themselves as well as the world. Within you, without you, they point to love that's gone so cold, and they chastise the people who gain the world and lose their soul. Then the pointed question to their audience, to their listeners, they don't know, they can't see. Are you one of them? The final verse calls upon the listener to see beyond yourself. Then you may find peace of mind is waiting there. And the time will come when you will see we're all one and life goes on within you and without you. The Beatles 
global sensibility and their passion to promote peace in a time of violence and war took them far beyond the recording studio. In the years following the release of Sgt. Pepper, they made international headlines with their travels and actions. World music was moving into American popular music, but no group did as much as the Beatles to incorporate, celebrate, and perform music influenced by Asian philosophy, religion, aesthetics, and instrumentation. They traveled to northern India in 1968 to participate in a transcendental meditation training session at the ashram of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. This trip grounded their borrowing of Indian musical traditions and instruments in a philosophical exploration that framed many of the themes in their songs. Cultural studies scholars have long noted that in the Western mind, the West has been understood as powerful and masculine, while Asia has represented the feminine, the childlike, and the dependent. While the Beatles never explicitly addressed the gender implications of their embrace of Indian philosophy, they expressed it nonetheless. Another moment of international attention came in 1969 with John and Yoko's famous honeymoon bed in. In their most controversial promotion of the connection between peace and love, the couple went to Amsterdam and invited the global, the global press to join them in their hotel suite where they spent a week in bed for their honeymoon. Eager reporters jammed the location expecting a scene of sexual display. Instead, they counted John and Yogo fully clothed in modest white pajamas with peace signs and symbols and flowers decorating the room. Instead of sex, the couple talked about peace for 12 hours each day. As Lennon described it, there we were like two angels in bed with flowers all around us and peace and love on our heads. We were fully clothed. The bed was just an accessory. We were wearing pajamas. But they don't look much different from day clothes. Nothing showing. Ono added, we thought that Amsterdam was a very important place to do it because it has a very fresh and alive interest. And we're thinking that instead of going out and fight and make war or something like that, we should just stay in bed. Everybody should just stay in bed and enjoy the spring. <coughs> they knew, of course, that their publicity stunt would have little actual impact on the peace movement. And they enjoyed the absurdity and playfulness of it. But at the same time, they upended the prurient interest the bed-in aroused and instead made a statement for peace. The arc of the Beatles' career in the 1960s spanned the decade from innocence to radical protest and resistance. They were not the same sort of protest performing artists as someone like Dylan, for example, although lyrics of some of their songs, such as Give Peace a Chance, were explicitly political. At the same time, their cultural radicalism in their lives as well as their music places them in the vanguard of many of the most profound trans transformations unleashed in the 1960s. Many Beatles songs can be unpacked to show astonishing insight into the human condition, relationships, gender, and the life course. I suggest that many of their songs are radical for their time or for any time in terms of popular music. While they never promoted themselves as feminists, nor were they clam claimed by either the feminist or the LGBT movement, their gender-bending personas and songs and their examination of emotional depth, struggle, and sadness place them in the radical political and cultural tradition that the feminist movement also embraced. And then there was their playfulness. Feminists are often disparaged for having no sense of humor, which couldn't be far farther from the truth. Just consider the playful protest at the Miss America contest in Atlantic City in 1968, when feminist activists crowned a pig and tossed constraining undergarments into a freedom trash can. Contrary to legend, no bras were burned, ever. Put that up against lovely Rita, and you have feminist critique at its best. The feminist movement never explicitly embraced the Beatles, and the Beatles never identified themselves as feminists, but they coexisted on that radical cultural plane. The feminists were the ones to insist that the personal is political. The Beatles were singing that message and living that message all along. Because of that sensitivity, I think that the Beatles, with their brilliance, their musical genius, and their social criticism, deserve a place in the feminist canon. Thank you.
That was great, Luke. Thank you so much. Wonderful analysis of just the beautiful reading of the lyrics of poetry, too. Thank you for that. So we've got two more musical acts for you to uh, close out the night. Excited to bring to you uh, the Cullinans. And if you've ever had a Lewis Carroll daydream in which plasticine porters watched Lucy fiddle in the sky with diamonds, then you're about to have a flashback right now. So please join me in welcoming this incredibly talented duo, the Cullinans.
we'd like to be on here. We'd like to take you home with us. It's a little bit creepy, though. So instead, we'll just thank you for being here. We invite you to join us again in September when we start up our 2017-18 season at the DePaul Humanity Center and remind you that life flows on within you and without you, that that final E chord from a day in the life is actually still ringing in your ears if you really listen for it, and if you can't hear it, just ask your dog. One last round of applause for all of our professors, our performers,